and doing my presentation online. And also, um, it is a bit hard for me as a non-native English speaker um, to give English presentation online, actually. But I'll do my best. OK. And today, my topic is about um, ecology and the theory of ground rent. And, and today's my talk is based on my working paper um, published online. And let me share, share the um, my working paper, this one, yes. And my working paper is on the website of the academic body in Japan called the Political Economy and Economic History Society. And this is one of the oldest um, Japanese um, academic body um, on Malkian economics. And recently, this academic society published a series of working paper. And I actually, I was the first to give a paper to the, the series of working paper. And you can uh, download the working paper from here. And my talk will be based on this. Let me give this URL on a chat window. And actually, um, this academic body has recently set up uh, English international sessions. And now it is submitting um, call for papers for its annual conference. And the deadline is the end of May here. So if you are interested in uh, giving a pl presentation, presentation online, um, please contact me. All right. But um, today I will uh, use slides to give a presentation. So let me screen share the slides. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. So um, again, my topic today is titled uh, Reconstructing Malkian Theory of Ground Rent, and the subtitle is based on Japanese development of Malkian political economy. So this is about ecology and Marx. And as far as I know, ecology and Marx is one of the most discussed topics in Western Malkian political economy in this century. But the discussion is not much accompanied by the development of the study of economic theory in itself, as far as I know. In particular, the rent theory is seldom revisited, even though it is the main sphere where Marx argued the relationship of capitalism and nature. This lack of study has apparently resulted in overlooking the ecological effect of the activities of land-owning class, I think. Michel Lurvy said, for example, an ecology that does not take account of the relationship between productivism and the profit motive is doomed to failure. However, considering profit-seeking activities of capitalists is not enough, as the landowners seek rent, not profit. So there is a categorically, categorical difference. A more conceptually sophisticated analysis is needed here to establish a rent theory of ecological Marxism, I think. The recent shortage of economic study is partly due to the reflection on economic determinism in the conventional Marxism. And there is even open hostility to economics in ecological Marxism. However, the study of economics is different from economic determinism. Econ economics does not insist that economic factors determine everything. They are just one of the causes of social phenomena. Insofar as capitalism takes economic logic as a driving force, the role of economics cannot be ignored. 
ecological Marxism has to be complemented by the critical study of economic theory, namely the theory of Marxian economics. So Japanese development of Marxian studies can contribute to addressing this issue. In Japan, Marxism is mainly accepted and developed as economic studies in academics. However, Japanese Marxism has paid little attention to environmental matters. We are to synthesize the environmental concerns in Western literature with economic analysis in Japanese discussions. And this paper aims at reconstructing Marxian rent theory based on the Japanese development and thereby enlarging the perspective of eco ecological Marxism. So Marx theory of ground rent is inherited from Ricardo's theory. In Ricardo's principles, he explains the origin of ground rent by referring to two factors, the limited use of land and the difference in the productivity of land. This is what is later termed as differential rent, as we all know. It, it also should be noted that Ricardo assumes land cultivation begins from the land with stereo productivity to the land of an inferior quality. When the land of the second deg degree of fertility is taken into cultivation, the productivity will fall and the amount of labor per unit rises, which means the rise in the value of the product. There occurs a difference between the market value and the value of the product produced in the sparrow land. This forms the source of ground rent that is paid to the landowner. Therefore, corn is not high because the rent is paid, but the rent is paid because corn is high, as Ricardo insisted. Ricardo's theory of differential rent is in this sense consistent with his labor theory of value. And this is why Marx highly appreciated Ricardo's formulation. The structure of Marx, Marx theory of differential rent is, I think, basically identical with Ricardo's one. However, Marx was not satisfied with Ricardo and making critical comment in theories of surplus value. Marx insisted that Ricardo falls into a twofold historical error. On the one hand, he assumes that the productivity of labor in agriculture is absolutely the same as in industry thus denying a purely historical difference in their actual stage of development. On the other hand, he assumes an absolute decrease in the productivity of agri agriculture and regards this as its law of development. He does the one in order to make cost price on the worst land equal value, and he does the other in order to explain the differences between the prices of the products of the better kinds of land and their values. The whole blunder originate in the confusion of cost price with value. This passage could be a clue to the complicated logic in the rent theory in Capital Volume 3. It is assumed that Marx should have tried to overcome Ricardo to fix what he deemed as a twofold historical error. First, Marx does not make cost price on the worst land equal value here as he said, if the value of the product is higher than the cost price on the worst land, there arises a possibility that the landowner of the worst land could appropriate the rent distributed from the differential. This portion of rent is investigated as what he termed differential, also, rent, differential rent, also on the worst cultivated soil. And this later develops into the form of absolute rent. Second, he rejects an absolute, absolute decrease in the productivity of ag agriculture here, as he criticized Ricardo, and explains the differences between the prices of the better kinds of land and their values, exclusively from the difference in the productivity. Monk shows in theories of surplus value the incorrectness of the Ricardian concept that differential rent depends on the diminishing productivity of labor on the movement from the more productive mine or land to the less productive. 
And therefore, while Ricardo only takes the one-sided assumption of descending fertility or productivity, Marx reveals that this is not necessary in analyzing the differential rent in capital volume three. This insight encouraged him to investigate the cases where the difference in productivity changes through the investment in land. Here we have two types of differential rent. The first type, differential rent one, or DR1, is based on the existing, differ existing difference in productivity. The second type, which is called DR2, originates in the difference in productivity that arises from additional investment. So in this vein, discovering a two, two-fold historical error of Ricardo has led to Marx's development of rent theory, which mainly takes two forms, differential rent and absolute rent, here and here. And the differential rent is paid by a capitalist to compete with each other in order to use the land with higher productivity. The surplus profit earned in using the spare land must be transformed into the differential rent as a result of the competition among the users, namely capitalists. On the other hand, the absolute rent arises from an alien force and barrier presented by landowners who refuse to let land to capitalists without receiving some rent. Where while absolute rent is thus based on the landed property itself, it generally cannot exceed the excessive value over the price of production, according to Marx. So Marx um, said absolute, absolute rent is based on the difference between value and production price, price of production. If there is no such limit, the rent becomes monopoly rent. But this is not Marx's original contribution because Smith, Adam Smith also mentions this. Anyway, Marx's theory of grant rent is composed of mainly two types of, differ two types of rent, namely differential rent and absolute rent. And generally three, there are three types plus monopoly, monopoly rent. Okay, now let us go into the discussion in Japanese Marxian economics. What characterized the arguments in Japan is its relation to the historical recognition of Japanese development of capitalism, which arose fierce controversy between so-called the Causa school and the Rono school. But today, let us skip the rent theory controversy between the two schools. As Japan recovered from the ruins of World War II, the agricultural sectors in Japan were qu quickly shrinking during the golden age of capitalism, consequently undermining the significance of the rent theory itself. Nevertheless, the study of the rent theory did not disappear entirely. It was because of the rise of the UNO school theorists. Marx criticized Ricardian assumption of tendential fall in the productivity of, in land. But Stomu Ouchi and Susumu Hidaka, these two figures, maintained that Marx's critique was consistent with historical facts, but not correct as a theoretical method. The two supposed Ricardo's view was right, actually and insisted that the land of the best fertility is the first to be cultivated theoretically. Ouchi and Hiraka's argument on differential rent is very similar to Ricardo's theory. So actually, absolute rent, which is not found in Ricardo's rent theory, comes to the fore in their study of Marxian rent theory as, as Marxian economists. Marx assumes the productivity of ag agriculture is worse than that of industry. Thus, the organic composition of capital is lower in agriculture than in industry. This means that the value of agrarian product is higher than its price of production. And this differential makes the or origin of absolute rent, Marx insisted, as we have seen. It was Kautsky, Karl Kautsky, who first doubted this assumption. 
in the form of the critique of Rod Peltus. Actually, this critique was not directed to Marx itself, himself. Um, Kautsky pointed out that it is very doubtful whether intensive ag agriculture could be practiced with a lower than average composition of capital as mechanization of ag agriculture proceeded. Also, the lower composition of capital can be more than offset by the slowness of agricultural capital's turnover. Realizing these problems, Kautsky had to reduce the category of absolute rent into that of monopoly rent. Absolute rent is the result of the excessive market prices over the prices of production, and how they did this is the method adopted by all cartels, restricting output, output to raise prices. Ochi and Hidaka in Japanese development took Kautsky's question as reasonable, but did not accept Kautsky's answer. Certainly, it is not plausible to regard the, the value higher than the price of production to be the source of absolute rent. As Kautsky noted, the products are sold at the price of production, not at its value, and rent is paid from the profit gained from the sale at the price of production, and not at the value. Thus, Kautsky was right in that he thought absolute rent to be the excess over the prices of production, but the mechanism of absolute rent cannot, cannot be identified with that of Kaltil, namely the, the origin of monopoly rent. Oji and Hidaka solved this problem by extending their analysis of differential rent type 2, DR2. In the phase where all the existing lands are privately owned and yield differential rent, the lands which are newly discovered are to be privately owned in expectation of generating rent. As a result, when capitalists use the new lands, the landowners require them to pay rent, the upper limit of which is demarketed, namely limited by differential rent type 2 in the existing lands. Ochi and Hidaka clarified that absolute rent should be discussed not in relation to the distinction between value and price, but in relation to the landed property itself. Ochi and Hidaka's rent theory has long achieved a standard in the Marxian political economy in Japan. After, um, for example, Makoto Ito's um, rent theory is almost based, based on these two figures. However, Ochi and Hidaka ignore the case where landowners compete with each other and make rent go down themselves. It is not only capitalists, but also landowners who face competition. We have to consider two cases here at least. When landowners have caught up in a price war, named as it were, the absolute rent will be reduced to zero in theory. Absolute rent can be gained only insofar as the landowners are in collusion with each other and can effectively prevent their competition between themselves. Michiaki Obata is the first indicating the idea that the collusion between the landowners is a precondition of absolute rent. Actually, he is my teacher. Based on this finding, he simplifies the rent theory as follows. Suppose two kinds of land with different fertility. Each kind of land is owned by two or more landowners. When the social demand for the product is sufficient for cultivating all lands, the landowners of the sparrow soil get differential rent. Here. On the other hand, even if the current social demand falls short of using the inferior land, capitalists possibly want to use it in expectation of expanding production. In this latter case, so supply exceeds demand, absolute rent can arise as long as the landowners of the inferior soil avoid their price war. So if landowners can be in collusion with each other, then they can um, ask 
or maybe require um, capitalists to pay rent to use their land. But on the other hand, if the landowners of the inferior soil compete with each other, there would be no rent for using the inferior land. If landowners are in competition with each other, they want to use, uh, let capitalists use their land and be in competition with each other. And this price war will reduce um, the rent to be equal to zero in theory. So there occurs, there occurs a class struggle between the capitalist and the landowner over the formation of la absolute, absolute rent. Absolute rent indicates the strong bargaining power exerted by the landowning class, just as high wages are the fruit of collective bargaining of the workers against capitalists. Capitalists are keen to undermine the alliance of landowners in order to reduce rent. Nevertheless, the class relation between the capitalist and landowner has not been fully studied. We would like to discuss it by using a simple two-sector model. So I think um, we are not very, um, we are, um, rather familiar with these kind of um, simultaneous equations. And this is really, I, I think, known equations in part of Marxian economics. And here the production coefficient, which is um, which denoted by, which are denoted by these um, signs A, and they indicate the condition of production in each sector. So A indicates production coefficient, and these two indicate uh, the condition of production in sector number one and the lower two figures indicate uh, the production coefficient in sector number two. And P1 is the price of products in sector number one, and P2 is price of the product in, produced in sector number two. And all is a general rate of profit. And land is one of the conditions of production and the difference in land productivity means the difference in the production coefficient. So land determines the value in these signs of A. Let us suppose that there are two conditions of production in sector number one. The one is only available with limited land, for example, waterfall, like, like this one and the other is available without geographical limitation. For example, steam engine. And the numerical examples are given like this. Meanwhile, sector number two has also two conditions of production and both, of, both are inseparable from land. Let us assume that, for example, um, inferior soil and superior soil. And these two kinds of land are used in the production in sector number two. So we can assume that sector number one could represent manuf manufacture, while sector number two represent agriculture sector. And the change in sector number two affects the production in sector number one through an input output relation. Take the following numerical examples like these. Let us assume that S1, this one, oh, <laughs> this one 
is the only one that is freely available. The rest of the three, T1, S2, and T2, are owned by landowners. And these figures are put into um, the figures values in A, and we can solve this equation. These numerical examples can be illustrated in a graph. When the landowners securely obtain rent in sector number two, the price of production in sector number two is determined by S2, since S2 is inferior to T2. S2 is inferior to T2 um, because both of the factors in these vectors are larger than T2. This means uh, S2 require more input than T2. So S2 is always inferior to T2, uh, regardless of the standard of prices. Assume the landowners of S2 are no rent for simplification. In this case, in sector number one, T1 is superior to to S1. So T1 can get rent. Um, this situation is represented by the relations in here in the graph. When T2 gets absolute rent, T1 also gets rent. However, as we have discussed, Absolute rent can be undermined when the competition between landowners cannot be effectively prevented. In that case, S2 can no longer determine the price of production in sector number two, and the price of product, price of product falls. So um, the determination, the, determinate, the determined situation is moving from here to here. In that case, um, the, pro the productivity in sector number one reverses. S1 becomes superior to T1, and because S1 is freely available, nobody is willing to use T1. So there will be no rent in both sectors in this case. The point is that um, the productivity order in sector number one can get reversed depending on the price of production. In this thing, the loss of absolute rent in one sector can result in the loss of rent in another sector. The decrease in rent can bring a chain reaction as it were. And the landowners in our example, therefore, seek for an intersectoral alliance to protect interest as the landowning class. We can assume that the situation. The capitalists are, on the other, eager to diminish the power of the landowners extended over the sectors. We can thus observe the class struggle between the capitalist and the landowner in rent theory that is reinvestigated by the price equations. This is one of the findings in this paper. And the other is uh, the activity of landowners to improve land itself. The amount of rent is not the only issue of class conflict between the two classes. There is an economic incentive for land improvement in, if possible. And there is also a need for new land development as the economy expands. Nevertheless, the land improvement and development do cost. It must be a problem who bears the cost. It is not only the monetary cost that the two classes impose on each other. The land improvement often entails environmental problem. The environmental destru destruction caused by the land improvement is critical in nature. This ecological cost will also be a conflicting issue. 
the conflict could be grasped more clearly by using our findings in, in the previous slides. When the power of the landowners is strong enough, and they can secure rent from the capitalists at any occasion. On the basis of this stable income, landowners can make capitalists invest in land improvements, even when the land capital lasts longer than the contract. Let's C be the monetary cost of the land improvement, I be the increase in income by the improvement, L be the term length of the lease. If the capitalist is to invest in the improvement, the capitalist must earn C times R as the profit for this, in, this investment. R is the general rate of profit. So C R represents profit for this improvement investment. Also, since the capitalist regards the land capital as fixed capital, the depreci depreciation must be calculated. This should be C over L in the simplest calculation. If I is larger than CR plus C over L, landowners can make capitalists invest in the improvement by abandoning part of the additional income and satisfying without obtaining I minus um, these figures. Nevertheless, this method can be taken only so far as the landowner can expect a regular income during the term of the lease. This is not guaranteed in the case of weakening power of landowning class, as the absolute rent can be undermined by the competition between themselves. It is possible that the landowner lose rent when the capitalist class succeeds in trapping landowners into price wars. The landowners then lose funds for incentivizing the improvements. It is the landowners who make permanent improvements under this situation. The landowners cannot help doing so because they are losing rent as a result of competition themselves. This leads to the downfall of small landowners who do not have sufficient funds for land improvement. When the power of landed property is undermined, the landowners can survive only by spending their own money in improving the existing land or cultivating new land. Marx does not seem quite conscious of the role played by the landowners in land improvements. However, it is certain that Marx clearly recognizes that the landowners are responsible for ecological effects of land improvements. Marx's real insight lies in his focus on permanent improvements, which are considered as an exclusive role of the landowners in the latter case of our analysis shown above. Marx revisits this topic in the last part of his analysis of differential rent as follows. The so-called permanent improvements, which change the physical and in part also the chemical conditions of the soil by means of operations requiring an expenditure of capital and which may be regarded as an incorporation of capital in the soil. Nearly all amount to giving a particular piece of land in a certain limited locality such properties are uh, as are naturally possessed by some other piece of land elsewhere, sometimes quite nearby. One piece of land is naturally level, another has to be leveled, and blah, blah, blah. Leveling, drainage, deepening, sand mixture, irrigation. These examples are all irreversible changes of nature by humankind. Hence, the damage possibly in good is also irreversible. Certainly the environmental damage caused by a temporary land improvement is also seriously predatory as shown in Mark's famous example of plundering guano. And moreover, even if we find another way of, way of improvement without relying upon predat predatory activity, the alternative method can be unexpectedly harmful. So we do not mean that a tempor temporary land improvement is negligible. However, while a temporary improvement might be averted in some way, a permanent land improvement causes permanent effects upon the environment and thus cannot be fixed anymore. So very problematic. Marx discusses how the fruit, how the fruit of improvements should be understood in the following sentences. It is indeed a truly amusing theory, whereby here 
in the case of one piece of land whose comp comparative advantages have been acquired, rent is interest. Whereas in the case of another piece of land which possesses these advantages naturally, it is not interest. However, land yields rent after capital is invested, not because capital is, inv is invested, but because the invested capital makes this land more productive than it formerly was. And this rent too, which may be resolved into interest, becomes pure di differential rent as soon as the invested capital is redeemed. Otherwise, one and the same capital would have to exist twice as capital. Here Marx maintains it is a truly amusing to consider rent as interest for capital investment. And rent is based on land, not capital, because the invested capital makes this land more productive than it formerly was. It necessarily follows that the landowner exists at an independent class and gains rent, not interest, for the permanent land improvement. So Marx does not forget to refer to the landowner when he discusses the damage caused by the land improvement. In the final chapter of his rent theory, Marx states <clears throat> as follows. Here in small scale agriculture, the price of land, a form and result of private land ownership, appears as a barrier to production itself. In large scale agriculture and large estates operating on a capitalist basis, Ownership likewise acts as a barrier because it limits the tenant farmer in his productive investment of capital, which in the final analysis benefits not him, but the landlord. In both forms, exploitation and squandering of the vitality of the soil takes the place of conscious rational cultivation of the soil as eternal communal property, an inalienable condition for the existence and reproduction of a chain of successive generations of the human race. In the case of small property, this results from the lack of means and knowledge of applying the social labor productive power. In the case of large pro property, it results from the exploitation of such means for the most rapid enrichment of farmer and proprietor. In this quotation, Marx compares the large landed property with the small one and insists that both forms necessarily cause exploitation and squandering of the vitality of the soil. It is maintained that the large land ownership is a barrier to the productive investment of capital because it does not benefit the capitalist. The large landed property would be regarded as favorable from this viewpoint, so long as it limited the productive investment of capital that can result in exploitation and the squandering of the vitality of the soil. However, the landowners themselves also have an interest in permanent land improvements as we have discussed. Hence, when environmental destruction occurs as a result of land improvement, the landowner as well as the capitalist should be considered as an undertaker. Indeed, Marx admits that exploitation and squandering of the vitality of the soil is precipitated by the most rapid enrichment of proprietor as well as farmer. In this view, the landowner is also, also responsible for the exploitation and squandering as a matter of course. So in order to compete, comp <laughs> I mean, complete ecological Marxism, we consider, it, we consider it indispensable to finish Marxian rent theory as a critical standpoint of studying the landed property system and the capitalist mode of production. We can analyze the both activities of landowners and capitalists based on the fruits of the framework of economic studies of Marxian traditions. So ecological Marxism should take into account the, the achievements of the traditional Marxian economics, um, which, in my view, um, represented by the Japanese discussions. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. So we start now discussion about your talk. So please. If you have any question, 
quiz like your question in the chatting room or ask me to the off microphone to open. Professor Sungjin, are you have a question? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I wrote my question in the chat box. Okay, can you see the, the question? Yes. Okay. Oh, first Long of all, one. yeah. I'm very sorry that the moderator uh, is still absent. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. not here. Only about, uh, some extent. So anyway, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, so so he, he, he should have presided and moderated your great thought. But anyway, so, and he is also supposed to uh, discuss your talk. So I'm not so uh, very well prepared to uh, discuss. So I would like just to uh, uh, pull some, uh, <laughs> but I think very extant, not internal uh, uh, questions. And I think yeah, your uh, so presentation is uh, really interesting and very so you see, although it's uh, uh, difficult. So I think it's, uh, it, as we all know, the rent theory is usually regarded the most uh, difficult part of Marx uh, capital. So I think that there's the reason why it, uh, this afternoon, so not so many it's an audience. So, but uh, I think uh, you, it's, uh, you, you will understand that. And uh, your review of uh, Japanese contributions to Marxian theory of rent is very informative and uh, very helpful. And uh, also, I think your, explain, so your explanation of Marxian theory of rent using a uh, price equation model and focusing on the ecological aspect is very. I think that it's uh, very original and it's uh, remarkable. So, so my question is, <laughs> or rather it's instant. Uh, so uh, uh, please forgive me for that. Uh, so my uh, first uh, question, is your rent model is, uh, illustrated uh, for the landed uh, rent? Is uh, to be applicable to the information rent or cognitive rent as well? So it's my first question. And the second question, uh, so what will be the strategic implication of your, or uh, I think your model, as you uh, mentioned, it's Obata, it's Obata's model, or it's Unoist model, I, I'm not sure. So it's rent model for current housing question. Well, as you know, it's a skyrocketing price of real estate, or for the uh, post-capitalist alternative, uh, that is uh, our agenda uh, of uh, this problem, uh, like eco-socialism or degrowth communism. Uh, for, for example, as, uh, as you know, it's uh, Lenin in the early 20th uh, century, this, uh, Lenin's uh, agrarian uh, program, like he uh, very uh, explicitly uh, related uh, the interpretation of uh, Marx's rent theory uh, with the is the, uh, socialist uh, strategy. So, for example, abolishing is uh, absolute rent or uh, monopoly rent or uh, differential rent or the nationalization or uh, and the, uh, the latter part of your presentation, you uh, you took not just uh, uh, is a uh, agricultural capitalist. But uh, it's the landowner uh, for the uh, land improvement. But the land improvement, according to your presentation, it uh, leads to the it's a, uh, it's a ecological crisis. So 
So, uh, so it's my second question. So. Okay. Um, Sanjin, thank you for your questions. And I think you have really um, understood my presentation very well. So um, let me answer your um, two questions. And uh, yeah, and before that, um, as you uh, mentioned, um, it is true that um, this, um, my um, study of the relation between um, rent theory and um, price equations are very, um, <laughs> you, you, unusual maybe. <laughs> in, also in Japan, there are no such kinds of um, study. But I think um, the theory of prices of production and the theory of ground rent should be related somehow um, because it is really um, internally related because the theory of ground rent is has very deep connection with the formation of the price of, of production and Marx has noticed that relations but he did not develop it um, in a clear way so it is a remaining task for as a to um, seek for the connection between the two theoretical spheres so um, I think um, it is it sounds very unusual but it is um, very um, and, and also it is difficult task, but it should be addressed, I think. And yeah, um, actually, as I a little bit men uh, mentioned, um, there are very um, few studies on the theory of ground rent also in Japan. I think also in worldwide, but uh, as ecological, uh, con consciousness rises also among Malkian economists worldwide. Um, I think we should revisit um, the theory of ground rent and seek for the relation between theoretical studies and ecological problems. And I think um, the theoret theoretical studies of ground rent in Japanese Marxian economics can contribute somehow to that issue. And as for the two questions you raised, the first one um, relating the theory of ground rent to more uh, modern problems such as um, <clears throat> information technology and cognitive capitalism, etc. And this is a very big problem. And I think um, in abstract, we can use Malkian theory of ground rent to solve these um, modern problems of cognitive capitalism. I think basically they share the same structure theoretically, but um, ground, ground, land, and um, intangible assets are in itself very different. So we have to um, consider very carefully about uh, the similarity between the two um, sectors. But I think um, today we, I couldn't um, touch upon these issues, but I think um, we can extend the theoretical um, scope into the those modern um, issues. So let us discuss further about this problem. Um, today, I, I couldn't um, mention that, but I think it is a very interesting and also important task. And the second question, I know um, in Korea, it is this is very big problem today um actually i just watched 
in in Japan, I just watched a uh, news about this problem in Korea, especially in Seoul, about high rocketing price of real estate. So I I think um, it is very understandable that um, this question can arise from Korean people. And but actually. Um, the theory, of, I, I, in my opinion, the theory of ground rent cannot be directly used to solve the problem of the um, the price in the real estate assets. I think um, we have to consider about the theory theoretical um, viewpoint of the capital market or asset market and this is very um ra rather related to the uh, what it's called in motion terms um fictitious capital so of course the rent can be capitalized and become fictitious capital or intangible asset in some way so it is related but the theory of ground rent can only explain the formation of the rent, uh, which is later capitalized as um, some kind of asset. So um, the ground, the theory of ground rent is not enough to solve the problem of the, the asset prices. We have to con consider or combine uh, the theory of ground rent with the theoretical study of um, financial systems and so on. So I think um, we have to develop them um, to address this very important modern problem. But I think um, I, 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 I suppose that I could contribute to the problem of ecological uh, Marxism by studying the theory of ground rent because um, as far as I know, um, Western studies of ecological Marxism um, shows host <laughs> rather hostility to economic studies, um, which are um, which Japanese Marxian economists um, were long engaged. So, but in my opinion, um, ecological Marxism should be grounded by the theoretical studies and. The theoretical studies in Marxism are have a very big competitive advantage, as it were, in economic studies, actually, because um, especially in Japan, Marxism has been developed as economic studies. So I think we should um, look up look upon. Um, the development or achievements of economic studies so far um, and avail ourselves of these achievements to um, to form a critical standpoint against um, today's very harmful, ecologically harmful capitalism. So, and my contribution was very, seems very um, small. Actually, I was, um, what, what, what I was, what, what I found was that um, capitalism is very harmful, not because, not only because cap capitalists are ecologically unfriendly, but also landowners under the capitalist mode of production are ecologically harmful. But, and this, I, I think, for example, Kohei Saito 
is also um, insisting this kind of problems. But as far as I know, his um, arguments are not based on um, economic studies. His arguments are based on Marxian thought, but not firmly based on Marxian economic studies. So we can um, complement his argument against ecological, I uh, know, I mean, against um, today's capitalism. And uh, we can complement his argument by um, further studying and developing um, economic theory based on Marxian analysis. So I think it is very important to forge uh, the two interests, namely um, study of Marxian economics and also ecological Marxism. Could I answer your questions? Oh, yes. Uh, hey, thank you very much for your uh, so very it's a kind answers and, and also the very excellent suggestions for our uh, so, uh, uh, future research so, subject. I think, yeah, I so, totally agree with your suggestion. Great. Thank you for your questions. Oh, you're very welcome. Has Gong He come, come here? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I have one question. Oh, yes, please. Oh. Uh, 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 the table you showed that the absolute land could disappear in competitive situation is, is yet, is right? Yes. Um, when? Oh uh, yes, yes. I think this one. Oh uh, yes. When landowners falls into competition between themselves, yes. the and and the under the conditions of uh, supply is more than demand. supply exceed uh, supply exceeds demands. There uh -huh. will be no rent in theoretical um, studies. Yes. Uh, uh, but however, I know Max Bills that must believe that if the organic composition of agriculture mm -hmm. is higher than the general industry, so he expected the absolute rent will be disappeared. So uh, yes, yes. Um, um, maybe I couldn't get it. Um, your questions, but yes, this um, argument on um, absolute rent is very different from Marx one. Uh -huh. uh, Marx, Marx uh, insisted that absolute rent should be based on the difference between the value and uh, the production price. But I think this is very, um, this is not true. Um, uh -huh. rent, rent should be paid from the profits and profit is generated when um, the product is sold according to the prices of production, not the standard of value. So um, the products and the agrarian products are not sold at the value, but at the prices of production. So we cannot, um, we cannot consider the source of uh, ground rent um, as, arising from the difference between the value and price of production. The, the, the difference between value and production should be solved via the transformation problem. And after that, the rent is um, paid from the profit generated according, according, accordingly um, the prices of productions. So I think Marx, Marx um, argument on the absolute rent should be criticized um, based on the 
viewpoint um, suggested by Kautsky. And we have to redevelop um, the, theory of the, the theory of absolute rent. And I, I think the absolute rent can be gained when the competition between landowners are prevented and also when the supply exceeds the demand. Uh, okay, thank you. So, anyone have a question? Okay, May, maybe there is no question, so we can finish your lecture here. So, okay, thank you for your great, great lecture. So, okay, thank you, thank you very much for thank gathering, much. And, and also, um, I hope next time I, I, I remember I said the same thing um half half a year ago but <laughs> i i really expect that we can um meet offline oh, yes. um in near future uh, i want to <laughs> <laughs> thank you okay thank you very much for giving me an opportunity okay goodbye bye 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 bye